This is the Create Your Own Life Show, where we interview people that are world-class performers, from Super Bowl champions to New York Times bestsellers to billionaires. We figure out what makes them tick and unpack it for you to do the same. I'm Jeremy Ryan Slate, and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we help you to create your own life. Hey, what is up, everybody? Jeremy here. It is Monday. It is the 10th of May, 2021, and this is the Create Your Own Life show. Hope you guys are enjoying the start of this week. Uh, we're five days away from my 34th birthday. Man, I am getting old. Um, it is slowly creeping up on me, um, but I'm excited you guys could spend this Monday with me, and uh, I'm just really excited for the week we have ahead for you guys. We've been working really hard on a lot of the awesome content that we have coming to you. Um, and today's episode is a really, really great episode. As we have with us today, um, leadership author, author of the Leadership Challenge, which is now in the sixth edition, uh, Jim Kuzis. I'm going to tell you more about Jim in just a second. I'm very, I had a really great time chatting with him. Um, but for, before we get into this interview, I just want to quickly remind you if you have not yet checked out the video version of this show, be sure to head over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever else you listen, and to make sure you do that now. If you haven't, or if that's just the audio version, sorry, if you haven't checked out the video version of this show yet, it's over on YouTube and Rumble, and we're putting in a ton of time on it, um, so it would be highly appreciated if you could definitely go check it out and uh, subscribe to the show over there, because we've really been working hard and we've been doing a great job of it. We're also doing now, as well, on our YouTube channel, um, show segments, which are, it depends on the episode, but they're six to ten minute segments from each episode, and depending on the episode, we have a few, so you're kind of going to get a... A, a way to consume some bite-sized content if you want to check it out yourself or if it impacted you and you want to share it with somebody else, you have the ability to do that, which I think is really cool as well. So show segments is a brand new thing that uh, that we're working on in the show. And um, yeah, so, so that's that. Um, and in terms of sponsors for this episode, um, this episode is sponsored by Audible and the kind people over at Audible have been nice enough to offer you all a free audiobook download and a free month of their service. Um, right now, I have just wrapped Unmasked uh, by Andy No. If you want to grab that book or any other book for free, courtesy of Audible, that is jeremyryanslate.com slash book. That is jeremyryanslate.com slash book. All right, so today's guest is Jim Kuzis. He is the author of the Leadership Challenge, which is now in its sixth edition. And uh, this is a really, really great interview because we're going to be talking about as a leader, um, how you create something others can follow, and it's not just what you write on a paper, and it's not just what you write on a wall, because people don't believe that. Like, that's crap. So we're going to talk about that and how you really create something that people in your organization want to buy into and be a part of, and how they can be a part of that. So this is a really great conversation for leaders, for people that are upcoming leaders. So without further ado, let's get into this interview with Jim Kuzis. Hey, what is up, everybody? Jeremy here, and I have the honor of having a really awesome guest with us today. We're going to chat about leadership, which you guys know is a subject very near and dear to my heart, and we've chatted with a lot of incredible people on this subject, from uh, General David Petraeus to you know uh, many other people out there that we've had in this space, and our guest today is really one of the go-tos um, in this area. Our guest today is Jim Kuzis, and he is the co-author of the best-selling book, Leadership, the Leadership Challenge, now in its sixth edition with over 2.5 million copies sold. That is a lot of books. Uh, he currently serves as a fellow at the Door Institute for Leaders at Rice University. The Wall Street Journal named Jim one of the top 10 best executive educators in the U.S. Jim, thank you so much for taking some time to hang out with me today. Jeremy, it's a pleasure. Delighted to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. Absolutely. Well, I, I wanted to start out with uh, something I just found really interesting in, in learning mm. a little bit about you. And um, I had read that, I think it was in 1961, you were part of the color guard for JFK's inauguration. Could you tell us a little bit about that? It sounds like a cool story. Yes. Well, thanks for asking. That's been many years since then, 1961, when John F. Kennedy was inaugurated president of the United States. And I, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, I was select. I was 15 years old when I was selected. 16 when I st stood uh, at the reviewing stand beneath the newly inaugurated president of the United States, John F. Kennedy, and his 
cabinet and members of his family watching the parade go by. Uh, I, I earned that because I was one of the youngest Boy Sc Eagle Scouts, and wow. a dozen of us were selected to be there on that very cold January day. I, I can only imagine. <laughs> uh, January in Washington D.C. is no picnic. <laughs> yes, it was. It was one of the coldest. I can oh still God. feel it in my feet when I think about it. <laughs> well, Jim, a, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is the world of of leadership, and it's interesting because I, I think a lot of people use the word and they don't quite know what it means or how to even do it the right way, which is quite interesting. So I guess from your perspective, you know, you've chosen to make this the area that you've spent your life in. Why does leadership matter so much to you? I think it has a lot to do with growing up. You mentioned part of that. I was a Boy Scout. Uh, I lived in the Washington, D.C. suburbs. My father was a civil servant all his career, starting out as a file clerk after World War II, working his way up to Deputy Assistant Secretary of Labor. His library was full of management books, and I just got curious at, at a relatively young age. You know, what's interesting is my brother gravitated toward nuclear physics on the hard science side, and I gravitated to the other end of the continuum on on the people relationship side and behavioral science. He was a, He's a PhD nuclear physicist, and I'm at the other end of the continuum as a, as a behavioral scientist. And... Uh, I just found it fascinating when I would hear my father tell stories about what was going on at work, about the difference in how people were relating to each other over the dinner table. And I also grew up being around people of many different religions and many different countries. We were a family that invited people from other countries to spend some time living in our house. We hosted, well, my parents hosted over 50 students over their lifetime wow. uh, at our house. And uh, so I grew up uh, eating dinner with people of varying political views, religious views, learn, and found just found it fascinating how people could have such differences of, of opinions about things, have different cultures. I got fascinated by all that. Originally wanted to be in the Foreign Service and later, while I was in the Peace Corps, I taught school and I got really drawn into helping others learn and I put the two together the notion of human relationships and teaching and ended up doing the work that I'm doing one thing I, I, I want to hit on there Jim is you mentioned um, you know all these different people coming into your home and having an appreciation for different cultures and things like that um, you know honestly that's one of the things that I've found most enriching in my life to, to all the countries I've, I've traveled to and spoken yeah. to and things like that is you learn so much about cultures and viewpoints and I think to really be able to, to lead you have to truly understand people right well that's at the root of it leadership is a relationship it's a relationship between people who aspire to lead others and their constituents their followers uh, who Ho the the leader hopes will follow them, but really following is a choice. So, so it, leadership is an aspiration for those who wish to lead, and a choice of those who uh, who uh, follow. Mm. And you have right, to understand so relationships if you're going to understand leadership at all. So I, I guess from from that perspective, um, you know you you you've talked about a lot in your career that there's there's five things that make someone a really extraordinary leader and I, I i guess the part i wanted to really start with because i feel like there, there's mm. many different viewpoints on this and it's funny so i was i was literally just speaking to uh philadelphia eagles hall of famer brian dawkins about this as he was really a guy that led a defense and and you know was able to get guys to, to be better because they were around him and, and i'm curious like in your viewpoint are leaders made or are they born <laughs> Well, over the nearly 40 years now that Barry Posner uh, and I, my co-author of all the books that we've written on leadership, uh, have studied this for a long time, and we have done the research on this very question, and I can tell you without a doubt that we have never met a leader who was not born. Really? 
<laughs> That's it. Oh, you got we're, me on that one, Jim. Yeah, yeah. Oh my, dead people don't lead. That's, yeah. So <laughs> you, oh man, you know we're we're all born. You know it it it. So the question really isn't are you born or not born. We're all born to develop ourselves in particular ways, and some people find that that's a path they, they, they choose. And what we have found is that the more time and energy you put into leading and learning to lead, the more likely it is you'll be successful. Literally, the more hours you put into learning leadership, the better you are at leading. Now, uh, I'm sure Brian would agree that if the more time you put into practicing whatever your sport is, the better you'll be at it. And uh, leadership is much the same. In fact, we took a look at some data, Jeremy, and we asked the question, what percentage of people that we have looked at, and we have over 5 million people in the database, so we, we took a sampling of that of about a million people, we looked at the data and said, who scores at the very low end? In other words, they, they essentially demonstrate no leadership capability, and then who demonstrates some leadership capability? So we were able to, to look at our data from the observer's standpoint and the leaders that they had observed, how many people demonstrated zero leadership capability? And the answer to that question is 0.00013%. Wow. So that's a that's very, very small percentage. That is one in one million people. So there are those who demonstrate none whatsoever, no leadership capability whatsoever. But that means 99.99987% of people demonstrate some. And then how do you move that needle so that you get from just a little bit of it to a lot of the right behaviors? And that requires training and development. So we're all born. And uh, if we spend some time learning and developing ourselves and being in the right kind of environments where those opportunities are available to us, we are significantly more likely to demonstrate leadership capabilities. Jim, I, I heard you in preparation for this interview uh, tell that joke on another podcast. And <laughs> I didn't get that. It, I didn't get that it was a joke until now, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, how slow am I?" Um, so I, I can I can definitely appreciate that. So I guess like if I'm hearing this right, like I can understand I can be a leader. What things do I focus on then to be a better one, right? Because I know like you look at certain segments of society and more leaders come out of some areas than others. Like, you know, like you look at the military, a lot of great leaders come out of there because of the way that they train. So yeah. how do we train to become a better leader? Well, the military academy is obviously a great example because that's what they focus on. And so you're spending four years of your education and plus there's a requirement in the military, if particularly if you're an officer, that you continue that development over time. And so they're always focusing on the development of leadership capabilities, regardless of what your specialty is uh, as an officer. And so that the data suggests about two hours a day is about the right amount of time we ought to be spending learning continuously over our lifetimes of leading. What to focus on? There are five practices of exemplary leadership we've uncovered. When we, we looked at our research data, where we ask people, tell us about a time when you were at your best as a leader, you know, your Olympic gold medal winning performance as a leader. We looked at all those stories that came out of that research question and hours of interviews and found that there were five practices that, that people tended to engage in when they were leading at their best. The first was model the way. Second is inspire a shared vision. Third is challenge the process. Fourth, enable others to act. And the fifth was encourage the heart. And so over the 35 plus years we've been researching that model, we continue to collect data on that to determine, well, are those effective or not effective? Are they still true today uh, as they were when we first did this research? But th that's really the, then the focus, the framework we use to develop leaders. Uh, we help them to learn how to clarify their values, set a good example, learn how to envision the, uh, the long-term future, think about hopes, dreams, and aspirations of others, and how they can integrate those into a, a shared vision of the future. We talk about searching for opportunities and then experimenting and taking risks and learning from mistakes, fostering collaboration, 
helping others to develop their skills and abilities and making sure that we recognize individuals and celebrate the successes of teams. So those are the behaviors and the, and the commitments and practices we focus on. So I, I want to look, take a look at that idea of, of creating a vision, right? Because I, I, I see that there's, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I see that there's really two main problems with this. There's people that don't know how to create a vision, but then there's some that have it and don't know how to convey it to the people on their team. So I, I guess when we're looking at this, how do we know that the vision that we have is, is, is what it should be? And then how do we convey that to others so they can be a part of that? Because it's, it goes along with what you just said. <laughs> Absolutely, Jeremy. It's really two parts, as you, as you articulated. The first part is making sure that I'm clear about my hopes, dreams, and aspirations for the future, mm -hmm. and that I can communicate those uh, in a way that other people can s see themselves in the picture. You know, an analogy uh, might be if you, if you think about uh, a jigsaw puzzle, and a jigsaw puzzle has many pieces to it. Let's just pretend that uh, I bring to, to you a jigsaw puzzle with a thousand pieces. And I, It'll take me about two days, but I'll get it done. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, I, you know, given that, if I dump that puzzle on the, you know, the box, out of the box onto the tabletop and say, okay, Jeremy, put it together, what do you want to know from me? What do you want? What do you need? What do you want at that moment? Just seeing. I, I want to know what I'm matching it up against, and and I'm weird too. I know some people start with the edges. I find colors that match, and then I go out from there. But I want to see like what I'm matching it up with. Yeah. So we, when we ask that question empirically, people the 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 most common response is, I want to see what's on the box top. Yeah. I want to see the end result. So as human beings, leaders need to understand that as human beings, people want to see what it's going to look like when I'm done putting my piece in this puzzle. What we do at work typically is we give people pieces of a puzzle and then we say put the puzzle together without sharing with them the end result. Mm. That's the major mistake that leaders make in trying to convey a vision that they've imagined, even one that might be highly desirable by constituents, but they fail to articulate what that is. And so leaders need to spend significantly more time communicating a vision of the future. According to our data, it, it's somewhat correlated with level. The more senior you are in an organization, the more time you need to spend on envisioning the future. That's because there's a longer time horizon. You, you may be spending 10 to 25 years before there's a new product or a new process in place. I mean, if you think about building an airplane for the future, uh, that may take uh, 25 years to go from concept to execution. And the technologies haven't even been invented yet for something that might be released 25 years from now. So you have to have the ability to think long term, the ability to imagine, and then the ability to communicate that to other people in such a way that they can see themselves, literally see themselves in that picture. Oh yeah, I can imagine being there. I can imagine doing that. I can imagine contributing my skills and abilities to the creation of that. So I guess from that standpoint then, like, you know, I, I can see how you're talking about getting people to really feel like they're a part of that and buy into that. How do we sustain that over time? Because I think too, like organizations have ebbs and flows, right? They're maybe th through a really big growth curve. The economy may change, products may change. So how do we sustain that over time and keep people buying into the vision? Repetition, repetition, repetition. I remember one senior executive saying to us, inspiring a shared vision is not an annual speech. Inspiring a shared vision is a Some daily, mo yeah, that's right. They And they put it on their website and expect that all the employees will rally around, all the customers will salute. Uh, that's not how it works. You have to continuously repeat as a leader where we're headed, particularly in challenging and difficult times when people get so focused on the immediate get so focused on the crisis at hand that they often forget why we're why are we doing this you know one one little uh, aside from this pandemic one of the things that is very interesting about the current situation the adversity we the globe has faced over the last 12 now going into you know 15 months is that it's caused people to reassess priorities people are saying to themselves you know i've been working from home now for 12 months, some of, some, some of us and other people part of the time. 
And uh, they're saying, you know, maybe I really would like to spend a little bit more time with my family than I have been at work. Why should I be working so hard? Why should I be putting in all this effort? Maybe there are other ways of, uh, of organizing our workplace. All of these kinds of questions are coming up. Leaders, particularly now, have to be able to articulate the why. Why is this so important? What are we trying to create together that would make it worth your time in order to continue to put forth the effort? Leaders must be able to answer that question, particularly during times of crisis, challenge, and adversity. Well, that's a really great point, too, because I know it's something that we've been... I've been really trying to work on in my company is, you know, we've, we've been virtual before all this stuff happened. You know, we have, uh, I think we're up to 16 people mm -hmm. across the country. And I will say one of the more difficult things is creating a team environment when everybody's in all different places. And I'm, I'm curious if like, you know, you've really seen how companies are doing that and leading in, the, in that way through this pandemic. I'm, I'm curious what you've seen in that. Well, what we, what we do is help people to do this kind of clarification in these difficult times uh, and also to find ways to engage in more conversation with others about their hopes, dreams, and aspirations. Uh, let, me, let me just give you a, a couple of examples. So it, it, with, with one recent client, we had them do an exercise called the life exercise. And this was not just the leader, but this applied to everyone. And he, he, here is the way we set it up. We said, like you, like you to imagine that five years from now, 10 years from now, you are awarded Team of the Year Award. And everyone on the team, we'd like you to think about four things. The lessons that other people learned from you the ideals you stood for, the feelings that they had when they were working with you, and the evidence that you made a difference. So think about those four things. Lessons, ideals, feelings, and evidence. That acronym is L-I-F-E, or LIFE. Ah. And so we had people think about their lives, and we had them articulate that, and they each talked about it individually. What I would like people to learn from us, the lessons, the ideal, talk about the ideals that we stood for, the feelings they had when they were around us, and the evidence that we made an impact. And then collectively, let's see if there aren't some common themes that come through. So that's just one way in which we help people to uh, articulate their aspirations for the future and then to look at what they share in common. I'm curious uh, how many common like ideas you found there, because I'm sure there was a lot of things that, that intertwine in like what people were looking for in the, that, that exercise. There are there are some commonalities and and some different uh, some uniquenesses depending upon the type of organization. Uh, so if if we look at set of lessons learned, uh, oftentimes. They are about, you know, how to work well together, teamwork, cooperation, collaboration, uh, sort of dedication, persistence, and hard work, and the value of that. Uh, grit, you know, that, that we stuck to it, that we really put our, even during times of adversity, we were, showed how grateful we were for the things that we did have, even though there were a lot of losses, a lot of, uh, of problems along the way. So those are some of the common themes that, that, that tend to come out. Uh, I think particularly around when, when people talk about the, the F part, the feelings part, uh, they to also talk a lot about caring and supportive during times like this. We really uh, want people to experience how much we care about them, how much we, we support each other and how much we support others outside of our team. Uh, in, in fact, in our most recent research on characteristics of admired leader, those two qualities, caring and supportive, have increased in their importance to people during the last 12 months compared to all the years previously. And so those uh, feelings uh, have, have come out more frequently right now and obvious, there's obvious messages for leaders. If people want a more caring and supportive environment, that has implications for how you behave towards others. 
How do you think that, you know, how we've seen the past year change the workplace and change organizations? How do you think this changes leadership culture moving forward? Like, is this an inflection point or, or where do we go from here? This is still an empirical question. And in fact, Barry and I are going to uh, look at our data from only 2020, uh, where it's, it, it's literally being uh, uploaded to us in, over this next couple of weeks. And we'll be taking a look at what the data tells us. But here, here's a way, perspective we're putting on this. Context changes a lot. So the, the context right now is quite different than it was 15 months ago when everything stopped or started to, we, we started to get concerned about it. And then in March, a little over a year ago, uh, we, everyone got locked down practically worldwide. Well, that's a change in context. Then the question becomes, have the leadership behaviors changed as dramatically as the context has? And what we're finding is that the context can change dramatically, but the content of leadership, the behaviors that have we, we've been talking about for the last 35 years, haven't changed much at all. Mm -hmm. We've learned a lot more about them. And, uh, I just mentioned some that people are looking for more caring and support, but we found that that was true even in the past. Mm -hmm. So what seems to be the case, Jeremy, is that certain behaviors may need more emphasis right now. We may need to be spending more time and making sure that people know that we care about them, that we're concerned about them, that we're listening to them, that we're going to offer the support that we can. We know it's difficult. We know you're facing more challenges given personally, given this current situation, and, and we're here to support you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's, a, that's really not a change in the behaviors. They've always been there. It's just how much emphasis they get. Absolutely. Well, Jim, I want to come back around to you a little bit because I have two questions that I ask every guest. Um, and the first being, if you were to take a look at Jim at 21 versus Jim now, you know, what is something you believed at 21 that you do not believe now? I think the, the, the values and beliefs that I hold today seem to be pretty consistent with the values and beliefs I held previously. But I think it was some of the assumptions I made about how one gets ahead in life. I used to think, uh, you know, uh, that, that it was, I, w I was the reason why I got ahead in life, that it was always up to me. But what I realized is that you can't do it alone. Yeah. I think the most important lesson, and as I reflect back on my own career and how I got each and every job that I had was that it was because other people reached out and helped me. Or when I asked someone for advice and counsel, they were willing to give it. Or when I sought a mentor, that mentor was willing to take me under his or her wing and offer me advice and counsel. Uh, that I, I've always written with a co-author. And I can tell you that if I had to do all this alone, it'd probably be a very different book. Yeah. Uh, or books that we've written. So uh, I have found throughout my career that the most important lesson I have learned about success, in, in at least in my career, and I think this applies to more than just Jim Kuzis, is that you can't do it alone. Uh, leadership is a team sport. It's not something you can do by yourself. You can certainly lead yourself, but when you're trying to lead other people, that requires building relationships with others. So I think that's probably the most important shift I made in my own attitude about what I need to do in order to be successful in my career. And really, it's all about relationships. Absolutely. I, I think there, there's no bigger lesson than success is, a, is really a collaborative thing. It's there, there, it's, you, you can't really have it by yourself because you do have to figure out you know, how you can help others, how others can help you. And, and without that, you know, what is it, you know, it's not success. Absolutely. So, and so, go ahead. and the, I, I think part of the lesson then for both leaders, but, you know, I want to broaden the concept of leaders that it's everyone's business, that everyday people are also leaders. In fact, the most important leader role model for 
the majority of people in their lives it, are, are family members, particularly parents. And so when we think about mother, as a mother and a father or a brother or a sister trying to develop leadership in our own household, uh, these practices apply equally and that we need to think more broadly about the concept of leadership. And if we want to develop better leaders in our country or in, our, in the world, we need to apply these not only at work, but also at home. We're still working on that at home. My two and a half year old <laughs> looks at me every time and says, you're joking, dad. That's her new thing. I'm always joking yeah. when I ask her to do something. <laughs> I, I, I know the pain, you know. I, uh, having written about setting a good example is one of the things that leaders must do. Uh, I'm always held to that standard. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you need to practice what you write about, Jim. Uh, Absolutely. So we're always working at it. That's that's what we got to do. Well, well, Jim, looking at the idea of, of legacy, you know, that's the reason we do a lot of what we do, the effects we're making, what, how we're helping other people. And if we were far in the future and you could tell us what that legacy that you're going to leave behind looks like, what does it look like? I've had the good fortune, Jeremy, of... Uh, traveling around the world, working with individuals who aspire to be leaders. And I think if there was one hope that I had, you know, when, when it comes to celebrating my life uh, in the future, that others will say, you know, he was there to liberate the leader in me. Mm. That's awesome. Well, Jim, this has been incredible. I really, really appreciate you spending your time with me today for the people listening if they want to connect with you and learn more about what you're doing where's going to be the best place for them to check you out we have a website leadershipchallenge.com where it talks about all of our collective works uh, all our books and and various training opportunities that we have so that's probably the best single source there's a section on our research uh there's also a, some uh free downloads that people can go through to in our blog section. There's some white papers that people can find there. And uh, if you want to look up our books, you can go to Amazon.com and just put James Kuzis in and you'll find a few. And uh, I'm also on LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook. Very cool. Well, Jim Kuzis, thank you so much for hanging out with me today on the Create Your Own Life show. Thank you, Jeremy. It's been a pleasure. Delightful talk with you. Absolutely.